state. Okay. What else? No other residency programs are on this? Kentucky. Kentucky. Okay, Kentucky. All right, what else? Tempo. Okay, what else? Any other ones? Okay, all right, let's just get started then. Um, <clears throat> all right, can you guys all see my screen? Yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's start with Michigan State. Um, who am I talking to from Michigan State? My name is Jay. Okay, Jay. Okay, so you have a 38-year-old male comes to your office with this sore on, on his tongue. The dentist does a punch biopsy, and this shows invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Um, you do your physical exam, and it shows this three-centimeter granular endophytic lesion with induration extending just short of the tongue tip. Um, no extension past midline, no adenopathy on your exam. So how would you stage this patient, Jay? No, is the adenopathy just not visible on physical exam? Did we get a CT scan or anything? No, you don't have a, you don't have a CT yet. So what's the current stage based on your clinical exam? So it's three centimeters. That would make it pro a stage two. Okay, so T2 and zero, right? Yes. So it's T2 versus T3 because we don't know the depth of invasion. So Jay, what kind of imaging do you want? Um, I like a CT soft tissue with contrast. Of the neck or what else? Um, from, yeah, he head and neck. Do you want anything, do you want any um, chest imaging? Yes. Okay. So remember, you know, um, when we think about this, you always want to get a CT or an MRI, depending on your preference of the primary tumor. So I agree with you, CT neck. According to NCCN, PET is really only indicated for stage three or four. Um, so in this patient's case, you could argue it's a T3 and get a PET. At our institution, we do get a lot of PET scans. Um, and then CT chest really is only indicated for advanced nodal disease or heavy smokers, okay? That's the basic guideline in terms of that. All right, next. So this is just a review of the staging guidelines. Remember that depth of invasion is very important um, in the new staging guidelines. So really anything greater than 10 millimeters depth of invasion upstages you to a T3, okay? Even if it's a small tumor. Um, so I'm just gonna pick on you for a while, Jay, and then I'll move on to someone else. Uh, so Jay, in this image, which line represents depth of invasion and which line represents tumor thickness? So I would say that first blue line represents the depth of invasion. Okay. And then the second, that white line would be the tumor thickness. Perfect. So, so you know, the way to think about that is the blue line is, is drawing a tangential line to the normal tongue mucosa. And then they drop a plumb line or a perpendicular line down to the depth of the tumor. And that is how you get your depth invasion. But yeah, you answered that perfectly. Um, Okay, and Jay, uh, what do you need to do? Let's say, you know, you take this patient to the OR and you do a pan endoscopy to start the uh, procedure. What exactly are you gonna do? Are you gonna do a bronchoscopy? Are you gonna do a direct laryngoscopy? Are you gonna do an esophagoscopy? <clears throat> um, if we're taking him to do a pan endoscopy, I think that would include both the esophagoscopy and a bronchoscopy. But do you think that's indicated for this patient? I I don't think so because we know exactly where his cancer is. It's clearly visible. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's indicated. Do you think um, that there's any risk of second primary in the esophagus? I'm not sure. Okay. So in general, the concept is this. Um, if they are a smoker, there's a 12% rate of synchronous primaries. That means anywhere else in the oral cavity or oropharynx. So it's, or the larynx. So it's worthwhile to do a direct laryngoscopy in general. Um, 
you know, 1.9% of these synchronous primaries are occult, meaning that they don't show up on a CT scan, they don't show up on your in-office scope. So, you know, it's about a two, per, it's really helping you about 2% of the time that you're finding something, okay? And then the other thing to remember is uh, esophageal perforation is about 2.6% with a rigid um, esophagus scope and it's 0% with a flexible. So in my practice, I've pretty much, uh, you know, gotten rid of rigid esophagoscopy um, because it, it, you'll get a perf when you least expect it and then it's a huge problem on an otherwise very benign uh, um, procedure, okay? Okay, um, so Jay, uh, so let's say, you know, at this point, you've got your CT scan, it doesn't show any nodes on the CT scan. Um, based on the primary, it still looks like a T2 lesion. What kind of, what are you gonna offer this patient? I would offer them, um, in terms of the type of neck dissection, I would offer them like a modified radical neck dissection bilateral because from what I remember seeing of the tumor earlier, it looked like it was pretty close to midline towards the tip of the tongue. So there's a risk for bilateral um, mets. Okay. And in terms of- What levels of, would you do in the neck dissection? Sorry? What levels of the neck dissection would you do? Um, I would do one through four. Perfect. Okay. And, um, and, and you know, we, we just call it a selective neck dissection. You, you don't need to say modified radical. Okay. Just for board purposes, that's a selective level one to four neck dissection. And then um, what kind of reconstruction would you do for this patient? What are your options? So what kind of based on how big his tumor was, he's probably going to need a total glossectomy or at least a partial glossectomy. Um, and I'm not really sure what would be the best reconstruction option for that. Okay, so you know, or, or, yeah, I guess you could do like, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's okay. I just want you to be thinking about it. So I agree with your neck dissection plan. In terms of reconstruction, you know, it really depends how much of the floor of mouth is involved. Because the worst thing you can do is sew the tongue to the alveolus, right? That's you cannot do that. So. Um, there's obviously, you can do primary closure for some of these smaller lesions. <clears throat> you can also do something like a skin graft uh, or an Integra um, uh, to kind of span the defect without adding volume, without adding bulk. Um, but kind of the gold standard in, in these resections is, is, is a forearm flap or an, a, or an ALT just because it allows you to get really wide margins and then um, it does not tether the tongue at all. Okay, but it's some of these depend on the patient's age and, and other uh, factors going on. Um, okay, uh, who is from, con or you just finished this, okay. Okay, so pathology shows 2.3 centimeter tumor with 11 millimeters depth of invasion. Margins are negative, uh, PNI, LVI negative, and zero out of 39 lymph nodes are, are positive in the right, in the right neck. We, did, we elected not to do a bilateral neck dissection in this case. Um, we did not feel it was going to midline, so that that's why. But but your your rationale was fine. So what kind of adjuvant therapy does this patient need? Jay. Sorry, I missed the question. I just saw well, what kind of adjuvant therapy does this patient need with this pathology result. So because of the, so margins are negative and there's no positive lymph nodes. Um, really nothing. So what's the stage? What's the stage based on 11 millimeter depth of invasion? So because it's 11 mil millimeters, it'd be stage three. And yes, that would need multimodality therapy. Okay. So what do you want to give them? Chemo and radiation or just radiation? And why? Just radiation. Good. Okay, I agree. So pathologic says is T3 and zero and radiation consideration, exactly right. Stage three needs multimodality therapy. Okay. I'm just going to skip this um, uh, and move on. You know, this, this, this slide just basically uh, argues that, you know, you do need to do an elective neck dissection, in all oral cavity cancer. Okay. So really nobody should be getting um, a 
just a partial glossectomy with no neck dissection based on this uh, paper from the New England Journal in 2015. Um, if it's very superficial disease, you can consider it. But in my practice, I mean, I, I rarely uh, do not do a selective neck dissection. It's almost a zero morbidity thing. And, um, you know, it, we know based on this paper that it uh, improves your disease-free survival quite significantly, okay? And the way I counsel patients, I say, listen, if you had a recurrence and we observed your neck, you have a 53% chance of dying in five years. So it's not that you're definitely going to have a recurrence, but um, if you do, your chance of having a really bad outcome is, is quite significant, okay? Um, so why does the elective neck dissection work? I mean, patients ask this all the time. They're like, why are we cutting, why are you cutting my neck if, if I don't have any positive lymph nodes? And, you know, the way I answered is I say, there's two reasons. One is you're removing the lymph node packet before it can become clinically or even pathologically relevant, right? What if there's a, a two-cell metastasis and, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't even show up on the path report. So you're removing disease before it becomes relevant. Uh, number two, the, um, it gives you pathologic staging. So um, it defines the need for adjuvant treatment. So if there's a positive node, they get radiation therapy, okay? Um, okay, next person. Is there anyone else from Michigan State here? Okay, no. Okay, who's, who, who's here from Kentucky? Someone say something. I'm from Kentucky. My name's Adam. Adam. Okay, perfect. All right, Adam. So what subsites of the uh, head and neck need um, elective bilateral neck dissections despite laterality of the primary? Does that question make sense to you? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, anything midline, I mean, that's kind of defining laterality, but... Um, I mean, an oral cavity, um, like tip um, of the tongue, um, so palate, I'm asking, uh, hard palate, and then upper lip. Yeah, so I'm asking not, not, I'm saying ones that are all the way to the one side or the other. Um, gotcha. So what subsites need a bilateral a neck dissection despite, you know, being completely one-sided? Sure. Um, I would say supraglottic. Uh, hypopharynx and nasopharynx. Not completely sure on that. Okay, that's okay. So yeah, so the supraglottis, okay, anything in the supraglottis needs it, anything in the subglottis, the base of tongue, and the hypopharynx, okay? So just kind of remember that because, you know, they'll, um, a lot of questions on your boards will come up with these types of questions and, and they just want you to understand that concept, okay? All right. <clears throat> so, Adam, wh can you show me? Can you tell me where this lymph node is located on the CT scan? What level of the so neck? So, yeah, sure. Uh, it looks like you're in the submandibular triangle there, um, from what I can see on the uh, patient's left hand side. So, um, you're right above the level of the um, carotid bifurcation. Um, so, it's a level. Um, Two. Say it again, level what? Level two. Perfect, perfect. So what is that structure just anterior to the lymph node? Submandibular groin. Okay, perfect. So if the lymph, and just for everybody listening, if there's a lymph node that's anterior to the submandibular gland, we call it level one, one B. If it's posterior to the submandibular gland, we call it level two, okay? And 2A and 2B are, are differentiated by the internal jugular vein. Um, uh, you know, 2A being anterior to the internal jugular vein and uh, 2B being posterior to the internal jugular vein, okay? Um, so uh, based on this, Adam, where, <clears throat> uh, where do you think the primary tumor is? If this is the only node in the neck, if you just had to guess. Oropharynx. Ipsilateral. Perfect, perfect. All right, um, next. <clears throat> okay, Adam, so can you um, tell us uh, kind of 
just the attachments of these muscles really quickly? Um, okay, so uh, just kind of work our way around. So the temporalis um, along the temporal line uh, along the skull and then to the uh, coronoid uh, process. Perfect. Uh, the pterygoid, um, so medial pterygoid um, along the medial uh, pterygoid plate. Um, Wait, so, the, again, so, so the medial pterygoid attaches to the medial aspect of the, of the lateral, lateral. Of the Sorry. lateral, yeah, that's okay. Um, you know, I, it's kind of shown there on the mandible. I don't know exactly the uh, insertion yeah. along the mandible, but it's just the inside of, yeah, the inside yeah. of the ankle, yeah. Um, and then the masseter um, along the kind of inferior aspect of the uh, um, zygoma, uh -huh. uh, and then extending down to along the lateral aspect of the mandible, kind of along getting more towards the angle. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the lateral pterygoid along the lateral aspect of the lateral pterygoid plate, um, and that gets up towards the condyle. Perfect. Um, Perfect. And along the ramus as well. All right, um, Adam, what nerve travels between the lateral and medial pterygoid muscles? Yes, maybe, and this would be a complete yes, but maybe V3 um, as it exits, I'm not sure. It's the ling lingual nerve, okay? So the, <clears throat> the ling <coughs> lingual nerve always travels between those two muscles. And then Adam, um, which part of the pterygomasseteric sling is stronger? And you know, what I'm getting at with this is when you cut one side of the mandible, which way does the jaw deviate? Sorry, so when you cut one side of the mandible. Like let's say you do a hemimandibulectomy, okay? Uh -huh. And you do not reconstruct it, which way will the jaw pull? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I would say superiorly and, um, hmm, I don't know, uh, to be okay, so it, honest. So what happens is when you cut half the jaw off, the contralateral side, the um, medial pterygoid is stronger than the masseter, okay? So it's going, the medial pterygoid is gonna pull the, um, the, the jaw medially. So it's gonna, it's gonna mm -hmm. deviate to the, um, it's, uh, excuse, it's, so it's gonna deviate to the resected side, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, are there any other uh, students from Kentucky here? Adam, if you want to call out one of your colleagues, that's fine too. <laughs> um, let's see who is here. Mm, looks like uh, John. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay, John. All right. So, uh, can you answer this question? What special sensory fibers does the nerve pointed to in this um, picture carry? And, and first of all, what is the nerve that I'm that we're pointing to? Um, the maybe lingual. So, well. The inferior alveolar? No, no, no. So you had it right. Yeah. So this is the lingual, right? Because look, the inferior alveolar, the jaws, jawbone's already out. So it's already cut out. So this nerve is coming between the medial and lateral pterygoid, as we just said, and then going into the tongue. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's got um, afferents for taste of the anterior tongue. Yep. And what cranial nerve does it signal that through? Through seven. Perfect, okay. All right, um, we're gonna stick with you, John. All right, 55 year old male, biopsy proven squame of the larynx. On exam, he has an exophytic lesion of the left infrahyoid supraglottis extending to the false fold. On CT scan, he has invasion of the pre-epiglottic space. There's no adenopathy. Which of the following are viable treatment options? So first off, I want you to stage this tumor. Uh, he's got a T3N0. Perfect, okay. And so what, what and th th there could be multiple options that are correct, but just go, go through them and tell me why each one is correct or incorrect. Yeah, I mean, you can do a combined chemoradiation. Um, that would be appropriate um, for a primary 
treatment modality. Um, supracricoid laryngectomy would just depend on what his pulmonary status is. However, with it being a supraglottic lesion, you would need a bilateral neck dissection if you were to do that. So that B would not be indicated. Correct. Um, you could do a supracricoid laryngectomy with radiation to both necks if he does have good pulmonary status. Um, so you could conceivably do C. However, if you're already there doing the supracricoid laryngectomy, you might as well do the neck dissection. So, um, and then D, um, I mean, I guess if the patient has contraindications to chemotherapy, then you can consider doing radiation. Um, however, you would do better with uh, combined chemo radiation therapy. Perfect answer. Okay, so agree, T3, N0, A and C are viable options. Choice depends on functional status, as you mentioned, um, and uh, agree radiation alone is, is not ideal for this patient um, given uh, stage three disease. Okay, John, can you call on somebody else to answer some questions? Uh, who else is out there? <laughs> Let's see. Who's this Ariel Frost? Are you here there, Ariel? Ariel's not really there, okay. Um, Bailey, how about Bailey? Okay, Bryce. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm here. Okay, Bailey's here. All right, all right. So Bailey, 72 year old male, uh, biopsy proven squame of the larynx, on exam, 1.5 centimeter exophytic lesion of the right glottis. Um, his right vocal cord is paretic but still mobile. CT scan shows a lesion of the right true vocal cord with no extension to the paraglottic space, no adenopathy. So go ahead and stage this for me, Bailey. Okay, so uh, 1.5 centimeter on the right glottis with uh, mobile vocal folds, um, T1. But the right vocal fold is paretic. So what does that make it? Oh, but paretic, but still mobile. Okay, so uh, T2. Okay, good. Um, okay, so let's see, treatment. Um, radiation alone would be an option for a a T2 larynx, um, endoscopic excision with elective neck dissection. Um, I don't know that he necessarily needs a, an elective neck dissection. Okay. We'll see radiation alone to both necks and the larynx. That seems, um, that seems like um, over treatment. Okay. And then a uh, radiational lone to larynx and the right neck. Um, yeah, I would say maybe, yeah, I would say like maybe A and D are, would be like the viable options, but yeah, A. Yeah, so you were right. So, so typically for um, glottic lesions, you do, you do not need to electively treat the neck until it's a T3 or there's extension to the paraglottic space. And, and the reason for that is think about it, the paraglottic space is where the muscle is, right? The vocalis and thyroarrhythmoid, that's when the tumor is going to go to the lymphatic system. It's not gonna do that if it's just stuck in this ligamentous vocal fold. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, let's do one more uh, with you, Bailey. 43-year-old um, female with a superficial lobe parotid mass. The FNA is non-diagnostic. Imaging shows a poorly defined mass in the superficial lobe of the parotid with no skin involvement. Intraoperatively, uh, you send a frozen section of the mass. Which pathology would mandate an elective neck dissection? Oh, geez, okay. Um, I would say, so mucoep, high grade, and then um, uh, adenoid cystic, so A and D. Okay. So actually, you know, adenoid cystic typically does not present with nodal metastases. The rate of nodal metastases is about typically around 15 um, percent or like 10 to 15 percent. So it's, it does not mandate an elective neck dissection. Now, some people may elect to do it, um, you know, if they're doing a flap or something like that, they just are doing the neck dissection anyway, but it, it certainly does not mandate it on your, on your boards, okay? Okay. Okay. Um, can you pick on someone? <laughs> uh, it sounds like some of my co-residents are also here. Okay, name one. Um, let's see. Um, 
Let's go with art. Art. Okay, art. Are you here? Oh, he says he doesn't. He says he doesn't have. A, he's saying he doesn't have a mic. Oh, that's that, he's just making that up. Okay, <laughs> n- n- name someone else. <laughs> um. Let's see. Is Garen there around? Garen, are you here? No, Garen. He's in the operating room. All right, that might have been all of my co-residents. Okay, all right, how about Daniel Sharble? Are you here? I'm here. Okay, Daniel. All right, it's your turn. 28-year-old male with this scan, you decide to take out this tumor. Uh, the day you take it out, the pathologist calls you and tells you what, he, what cells he sees. What is the most common cell type for tumors in this region? So first of all, what, what do you think this tumor is? Um, I think it's probably a, a um, pleomorphic adenoma. Okay. So what cell types does that have? Myoepithelial cells. Perfect. Okay. What, just go through the other cell types for everybody's sake. What, if you see Schwann cells, what is the tumor? Schwann cells would be a schwannoma. Yep. Zellbalin is what? Zellbalin are uh, for paragangliomas. Perfect. And fissiliferous cells. Do you know that one? I always forget fissiliferous cells. Um, no, I don't know it off the top of my head. It's a chordoma. Chordoma. Okay. All right. Uh, one more, Daniel, or a couple more, Daniel. A 57 year old male presents with a mandible mass that has been growing for years, doesn't mm-hmm. cause him any pain, but getting difficult to chew. Biopsy slide shows what you see on the right. What is the treatment of choice for this lesion? So what is it, first of all? Um, an ameloblastoma. Nice. How do you know that? Um, I, I just, I don't know, pattern recognition. The way the cells, the cells along the basement membrane are, are aligned. Yep. So palisading cells, right? They palisade and, and there's reverse polarity of the nuclei, but sure, pattern recognition is fine. Um, but they, you know, they all line up in the cell and they form these kind of, um, you know, glandular looking uh, cells, cell shape. So, so what would you do for that? Segmental mandibulectomy. Okay, very good. So yeah, peripheral palisading cells where nuclei is away from the basement membrane. Okay, just remember that everybody. All right, veins of the head and neck, knowing your veins will keep you safe. So why I bring this up is to me, you know, there's two veins you got to know. One is the facial vein. The facial vein is always superficial to the posterior belly of the digastric. The lingual vein is always deep to the posterior belly of the digastric. That is an absolute. It's always like that. And the hypoglossal nerve is always deep to the lingual vein. If you remember those clues, you'll always kind of know where you are. Um, and I just bring it up. I, I like this picture. So, you know, Daniel, what would you call this giant vein um, coming off the jug here? What would you call that? Is that a facial or a lingual vein? That's a lingual vein. Perfect. And, and in this case, the hypoglossal nerve goes superficial to it. Um, so mm-hmm. it's kind of, it was like an aberrant anatomy that we saw. But, you know, it was confusing at first because you see this giant vein, you think, oh, that's common facial, but it's not. So, so don't get confused. Remember, facial always goes superficial to digastric. So I just want to drive that point home. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel, do you have somebody you can call on? Um, let me see. How can I view this more? Uh, I, I can do it. It's fine. Erica Ho, are you there? Okay. Christopher Peter Lenkite, are you there? Okay. Melissa, are you there? I'm here. Okay, Melissa. All right. Is this our Melissa from memory? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. All right. But I've seen, I've seen this PowerPoint, so I was trying to... Anyways, but... Um, okay, well, well, you can seem smart. Go ahead. All right. Well, I don't know. But a patient undergoes a radical neck dissection, cancer unknown primary, gets coverage of his crown for a clavicular flap. He had a PET scan at three months post-CRT, which was negative. Follows up with you two weeks after his PET, complains of a lump in his neck, non-painful. On exam, you palpate a hard but springy mass at the medial clavicle. What is your next step? Sorry. Um, I would say to OR for excision as ethanol may be unreal. 
Okay, so so this is a common question that um, you'll see on your boards. So what happened? What this question is getting at is that it's a radical neck dissection. So when you cut eleven, you get um, you get subluxation. Oh right. Mm -hmm. uh, See, you have seen this, but you don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. So, say so you get subluxation of the sternoclavicular joint and you get a spring. <laughs> so, you want to refer this patient to orthopedics, okay? Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's just, I'm going to recycle people here. So, so John, can you uh, answer this question? Yeah, um, so most of the time it's going to be superficial to IJ, uh, yeah. but in, in a minority, let's say 25% of the time, it can be deep to IJ. Yeah, and then, you know, there's those, the rare cases where it goes through the IJ, and, um, there's, and then there's a case where the IJ splits the nerve. I've never seen that one. I've seen about five or six where it goes through the IJ, like the picture shown here. Um, okay, so, uh, John, can you describe what you're seeing here in this video? It, it's in, in, specifically, I want you to talk about the, um, the left internal carotid artery. What's going on there? I'll, I'll play it again. Can you make that out, John? I know it's kind of hard with this video, but. Um, it's, yeah, I'm not exactly sure, but I mean, there might be either like some blush coming off of the, off the artery versus, I mean, I mean it looks like a mass, but I'm not sure if that's, you know, hematoma or pseudoaneurysm versus a crowded body, but it looked like it's not at the bifurcation, so I don't think it's a crowded body. So, could you see the video where I showed? Uh, oops. So, could, could you see how the artery, the the internal carotid, is going way posterior in the neck? You see that? Oh, okay. So then it'd be like a parapharyngeal space tumor. No. So th there's no tumor here. This is just a normal neck on a patient I was gonna do a neck dissection on. But what I always tell the residents here is, you know, you always look for that carotid artery, the internal carotid going posterior to the jug because it's an ectatic carotid. And, you know, clinically, this is what it looks like. I mean, look at that carotid. It's all the way in level 2B or in, in you know, 2A, whatever you wanna call it clinically. Um, but that carotid artery comes all the way there. So if you're cutting on the floor of the neck, getting off the jug, you will cut right into it if you don't realize this beforehand. So um, I think it's really important that you guys always look at the scans and look for that ectasia of the carotid, okay? Does anyone need me to show that video again or are you good? Yeah, can you show that again for me? Sure. Okay, thank you. All right. So why does this matter? I mean, okay, it's pretty, you're not going to cut through the carotid, hopefully, but what, what you could do uh, quite then, and have seen happen is the vagus. So when the carotid swings out like that, the vagus also swings out like that. And, and if you're bovying or bipolaring near that, near the jug, you can, you'll just, you'll prax the vagus and they'll wake up with the, you know, vocal cord paralysis. And it doesn't happen often, but um, it does happen in older uh, individuals. So just, just please be careful and look at all your scans um, so you avoid this complication in your lives, okay? All right, uh, next question, back to Bailey. All right, Bailey, um, this man comes to your clinic. So, you know, yes, it's an impressive mass, but I, I'm just, I just wanna get at the point, what is the most important thing in your workup of a parotid mass? What is the, um, I mean, I guess like the facial nerve. No, no. Uh, so yeah. in your workup, in your workup. Like path, pathology, pathologic diagnosis. Okay. But so out of these, 
<laughs> out of these choices, which one do you pick? Uh, for a for a parotid mass, typically would get an MRI. Okay, that that's what I'm. Um, so so FNA is controversial with parotid with parotid masses, right? Because if it's a cystic mass, it's not going to help. If it's a solid mass, you need to hit the right part of it. And then institution to institution, some cytopathologists are really good and some are not good. So um, you just have to. The only answer out of this that really um, is 100% is the MRI. You always get MRIs for parotid masses. Do not get CT scans. Um, so, you know, you see my little blur about FNA. It's controversial, but in my practice, typically I just get MRIs and then I take out the mass and then um, I will send it for frozen section. I prefer to do it that way. But there's nothing wrong with an FNA if you have a good cytopathologist in your institution. All right, uh, Bailey, um, why don't you do this one? So 25 year old female comes to see you for a mass behind their ear, soft and mobile. See the pathology below, which I stole from pathpedia.com. Which of the following uh, pathologic features are pathognomonic for this tumor? Um, looks like the chondromyxoid matrix. So what kind of tumor is it? Um, um, I'm not sure. You know it, come on. <laughs> it's the most common parotid tumor. Uh, Worthens? No, it's a pleomor- this is a classic pleomor- ple- Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, you got the hard part, which was the- <laughs> <laughs> So the chondromyxoid matrix, you know, remember these, pl- they're pleomorphic, right? They, they have, they look like different stuff. That's what that means. So there's different types of cells in it. So there's epithelial cells, there's mesenchymal cells, and there's chondromyxoid matrix, thus pleomorphic adenoma, okay? Mm-hmm. All right, all right, you can do one more. Um, <laughs> 50 year old female had a tumor on her palate which uh, prior biopsy should salivary gland malignancy. Um, it did, nothing else was shown on the prior biopsy. This is your defect. So you have a hole through and through her hard palate into her no- nose, okay? Mm-hmm. How would you recon this? Um, I mean, she could just use a, potentially just use an obturator. Sure, I like that answer. That's what I did for her. Okay, so more importantly, the path comes back intermediate grade mucoepidermo, uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. And then you ask your pathologist, what grading schema do they use? And they say the brand wine grading uh, system. Your margins are negative. What adjuvant therapy does the patient need? Um, it's a tough one, it's a tough one. <laughs> I honestly would, I don't know that much about the, the brand wine grading scheme. I'd have to look it up, but um, intermediate grade is, um, just, just take a guess. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, I would do, we'll go with uh, radiation. Okay, so so it's observation for this patient. So okay. this, this is why. So you want to remember there's, there's basically two, there's lots of staging systems or grading systems for mucoepidermoid. There's two big ones, okay? One is the brand wine and one is the AFIP, which is the armed forces uh, one. And basically, we all know high grade mucoep needs adjuvant therapy. Low grade does not. So the question is where does intermediate fall? And the brand wine tends to overstage tumors to intermediate, meaning that with the brand wine, you treat them like they're low grade, okay? And with the AFIP, they, it tends to understage intermediate, so you tend to treat it like high grade. So I know that's super confusing, but people, don't, pathologists don't agree on which staging system to use. Here they use the brand wine. You'll have to ask your pathologist at your institutions what they use, um, but, but this is the basic concept, okay? Um, all right, uh, let's go to Adam, Adam from Kentucky. Okay, uh, 44 year old female, 
slow growing, left broad of mass, <clears throat> causing pain, facial nerve is normal. Uh, so indeterminate FNA uh, repeat shows neoplasm of a certain malignant potential. Where's the best management? Okay. Um, so I think with this, uh, you have to discuss with the patient that um, because of that finding, um, I think that it would be appropriate to offer her a uh, parotidectomy, um, a surgical excision. And then based on that, you also have to have the conversation if this does come back as something malignant, then there may be a need for um, you know, consideration of treatment of the ipsilateral neck. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and what else do you see on them? I mean, you know, I don't know if you can see on your screen, but you know, this is a pretty aggressive tumor. It looks mm -hmm. like it's going into the dermis uh, or the sub fat. You know, it looks like it's extending medially near the stylomastoid frame. And what other, you know, obvious conversation do you have to have? With sure. That? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with the resection, then you're going to have to, even though her facial nerve function is normal at this time, uh, you may have to um, sacrifice. Um, you know, either a part or a main trunk of the facial nerve just based on uh, tumor involvement if it does come back to something malignant. Um, hopefully you'd be able to get some type of answer, you know, from your pathologist in the OR to kind of help further your um, decision making and also just kind of for immediate post-op counseling. Sure. Okay. So yeah, you got that. Okay. So um, keep going. So intraoperatively, and this is, this is, this is, these are all real cases, by the way. So you, you find the facial nerve and you realize the facial nerve is going directly into tumor on both sides. It's completely surrounded. You're going to need to sacrifice it just proximal to the PEZ and distally in the face of the masseter. So you go ahead and just sacrifice. I mean, there's just no way to dissect it out. So now the question is, what is the next best management at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think kind of based on what we're given here, um, I mean, I think reconstructing primarily kind of at the time, um, you could use a cable graph, so you can use something like the great auricular nerve um, graph uh, at this time. Um, but I don't know how post-operative, um, you know, therapy might affect that if this patient's going to need to get um, radiation postoperatively. I don't know how that affects your decision making, um, but you're also going to need to cover the eyes, so gold weight at the same time. Okay, so, so you know, I, I think the answer I'm looking for and what you should really be saying is A, right? Like, and you said that, absolutely, cable graph the nerve. That's the only thing that you have to do immediately. The eye, you know, the problem with the eye is if they're not out before, you can't weigh, you can't see what kind mm -hmm. of weight they need. So typically most people will do this in a delayed fashion. Okay. Now, if they're, if they're older patients are getting a big free flap, they're already there for 10 hours and you don't want to bring them back to the OR. Sometimes I do do it all at the same time, but um, really uh, the only thing you have to do is cable graph the nerve. What other things should you be doing on this patient other than cable graph? with the nerve. Is there anything else you can think of? I, yeah, I don't know exactly what you're, what you're okay. getting at here. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so, you know, you, so nerve to masseter is a great um, adjunct to cable grafting, okay? So you can cable graft a couple branches depending on what nerve you use, whether it's like you said, the greater rick, you can use the sural nerve, um, or you can use an, a nerve in the arm or thigh. But the nerve to master, this is really easy to do. You just draw a line at the zygoma, draw a line at the vertical ramus, and you, and you bisect those. So 45 degree angle bisection, and you just start taking a tenotomy scissors and you, and you divide the masseter muscle until you see the nerve to master. And it just shows up. I mean, and you take it, you flip it up, and you sew it to a uh, branch that um, typically innervates the smile, so the zygomaticus major. And, um, you know, I, this is something you don't need a facial plastic surgeon to do it. It's, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, it's, you know, anyone who can sew a nerve can do this, uh, basically, okay? Um, 
And this is an intraoperative photo of it just to show you guys. Um, so that's a, you can see the nerve to masseter. Uh, you know, we had just divided some of that muscle and there it is. And then you can see on the second picture where it's anastomosed to a uh, smile branch. And this is an example of a, of a lady I did this okay, for. Now bite down. And you okay. see when she bites, Relax. she smiles. Bite. Um, and okay. this took about 10 Relax. months bite. to get this result. Okay. But it's, it's a pretty good result. You can see it. She doesn't have that. I mean, I mean, her nerve was completely resected and she doesn't have that flaccid facial paralysis. She has pretty good tone in her mid face, as you can see on the left side. It's hard to even tell what side, you know, the nerve was taken. Um, but okay, um, so I, I just encourage okay. you guys all Relax. to learn this technique bite. and become familiar with it. Okay. And uh, you know, don't bite. depend on anyone else okay. to do it for you. Just, just learn it yourself because it's pretty straightforward. Okay, now okay. bite down. Good. All right. So uh, moving on. Okay, uh, Daniel. Yes. Okay, so pathology shows this slide. Can you, which of the following is true about this tumor? Um, I'm gonna say A. Okay, so no, so the solid form is the, so what is this tumor? That's adenoid cystic. Oh yeah, solid form is the worst. And then chemotherapy is good adjuvant. No, chemotherapy actually sucks for, okay. for Sorry. adenoid cystic. Um, is local, okay, let's just go through them. So, because yeah. everybody needs to know this. So, um, is local recurrence rare or common? Uh, no. I, th I would think local recurrence is common. Correct. Local recurrence is exceedingly common. Yeah. For advanced stage disease, is the five-year survival less than 50%? Um, I'm thinking in terms of 10-year survival, but yeah, I think five-year survival is still poor. So. So, so the way you want to think about adenoid cystic is the five-year survival is really, really good. Really good. Yeah. Really good. And then after five years, after 10 years, it starts to fall, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, if a patient has distant METs, should you still offer local regional surgery? My, my thought when I read that initially was no, but sounds like maybe, maybe yeah. yes. Yeah, so, so adenoid cystic is one of the few tumors <clears throat> that we deal with where even if they have lung metastases, we still offer local regional surgery because the lung metastases tend to smolder along for a long time, okay? So everyone got that? Adenoid cystic, slow and relentless. Everybody recurs at 30 years in adenoid cystic. It always comes back. Um, the five-year survival is excellent, but then the survival curve falls off after that. And then chemo is really only on trials um, in general. So we have a trial right now. You can get cisplatinum. There's no proof that it works. So surgery is the key for these. Okay. All right. Um, can, can, is somebody else on this thing that wants to volunteer their self actually being at the computer? How about Harleen Sethi? No. I'm, I'm here. Oh, you're here. Sweet. Okay. So I might screw this up, but I will do my best. Okay. This, this is all I can ever ask for. All right. So this is a 35-year-old with a right parotid tumor. This is the pathology you see. This is one we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. but what is the most important pathologic criteria which dictates treatment? Um, would it be preneural invasion? So what do you think this is? Oh, um, is this, it's not, is it, mm, it's not pleo. Not so, sure. So you see, so you see little mucus pockets here? Yeah. So mucoepidermoid? Yeah, so mucoepidermoid. Okay. What's the most important thing in mucoepidermoid that we just talked about? Um... Um, how would it be the grade? Yeah. Oh, histology, okay. okay. And, and what, what were the two uh, grading systems, Harleen? I know you were paying attention. So there's the, oh boy. Um, one started with an M and then you said the other one. Okay, so that's okay. So, so <laughs> no one, the, run, one is the brand wine. Brand um, wine, okay. Yeah. And then the other is the AM. So, um, so, so yeah, so just remember, you know, 
Low grade is good survival. High grade is bad survival. Grade is what matters from you go up, okay? And brand mine was the one that when it grades, you take it lower than what it actually says. Correct. Brand wine over calls things as intermediate. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, since I have you on here, Harleen, why don't you keep going? So um, this image taken from some textbook uh, is, is wrong, actually. So one of the cranial nerves is incorrectly shown in relation to the ICA and ECA. Which one is that? Um, let's see. <clears throat> Um, would it be the, is Vegas wrong on there? No, no, Vegas is just, you know, it's a carotid, so it's, it, it's fine. Superior laryngeal? So where should superior laryngeal be going? Should be going, uh, Um, I'm not sure. I'm all stuck. Okay. All right. All right. You can phone. A we'll phone a friend here. All right. How about um, John? John. Are you there, John? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Help us out. Just give me a second. I'll look it over. Sure. Shouldn't it be 12 going through the branches of, or um, through, like in between ECA and ICA? No, so, you, no, so, no, so 12 is going to be lateral to ECA and ICA, but nine goes in between, okay? Um, uh, oh, some people are answering stuff on this chat, cool. Um, so superior laryngeal nerve, Erica Ho says, sh should go posterior, but it is, kind of, it is going posterior to um, the ICACA, but, but nine should go between. Okay, so the answer is nine here. Um, so uh, Erica, um, can you tell me what three structures to pass between the ICA and ECA? Uh, so we just talked about nine as one of them. Um, I believe that, uh, and we said that the superior laryngeal nerve goes posterior, so it's not C. Correct. Um, I don't think the posterior belly of the digastric goes between the ICA and the ECA, so I don't think it's A. That would be impossible, right? Because we always right. we always bovey on the posterior belly of the gastric. Uh, right. The ECA every right. time. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. So it's either the stylohyoid or the stylopharyngeus, um, and I would say, is it? Well, the stylohyoid uh, goes through the post the Digastric, so like splits the digastric. So, is it the stylopharyngeus? Good job. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, because stylohyoid is right next to digastric, so it's superficial. Okay. All right, Erica, what approach would you use for this tumor? Ooh, um. <clears throat> all right, so it's right on the medial surface of the mandible. Um, I mean, I think it would be very difficult to approach it transorally unless you did a mandibulotomy. Um, I guess you could do it transparotted, but it, that'd be a little difficult because you'd have to get under, so maybe transcervical or a combination of transcervical transparotted incision would be best. Okay, yeah. So, so the way I, I think of these is 
you, you guys, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is the retromandibular vein here. Okay, so if the tumor is deep to the retromandibular vein, it means it's deep to the facial nerve, right? So if it, the tumor is all deep to the facial nerve, typically you do not need to find the uh, nerve. You can just do a transcervical approach and scoop it out from, uh, from deep, from below the jaw. If it's going lateral through the parotid tissue, then I typically find the facial nerve as well. You can do transoral, and now, you know, the big popular thing is do these with tors. But the problem is, you know, the visualization is not as good. And, you know, I'm sure there's going to be people that will argue this point with me. But if, if you rupture it transorally, it is a mess. It is, it is, a, it is a huge mess. And all you're doing is getting, getting an incision on your neck and you have such better visualization transcervically. So for me, this is a transcervical uh, without a doubt. All right, um, I have like one more, a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna skip through some of these. Um, all right, Daniel, can you answer this question? Yeah, Chamberlain, Chamberlain classification. So. <clears throat> Please identify all the structures. So um, the vertical nerve coursing with the actual carotid um, would be vagus. Correct. The nerve coursing, can't tell, is that going between or in front of? Um, yeah, the, so one of the nerves is going in front of. Okay. And one of the nerves is going behind. The one going behind, I'm thinking, is hypo hypoglossal. I think you're, you're flipping. Oh, yeah, yeah. So hypoglossal will be going in front, right? And then Correct. Nine, nine would be behind. Not nine. What, what's, it's, the one going behind is coming off of Vegas. See it? Oh, oh SLN. SLN. Yep, exactly. So, so it's, well, whenever you do these carotid body tumors, this, this is exactly what you see, right? You find hypoglossal, you lift it up. You dissect off internal, dissect off external, and what do you see on the back? Without a doubt, it's also always SLN. SLN. Boom. All right. Um, I'm just gonna move on. Uh, I don't know how much time I have. If you guys need to go, just go. I'm just gonna finish these really quick. Um, so this guy, um, Daniel, is is you know he's got like a T3 tongue tumor, so he needs a hemiglossectomy. What? What can you offer him in terms of reconstruction other than a flap? He doesn't want to wait for a flap. You can do uh, like a regional flap. You could do a, um, I mean, if you're saying him and gloss, I mean, you don't really want to do a primary closure if you're going to take it, you know, more than half of his tongue. Um, sure. You could do a um, submental artery island flap. You could theoretically do a uh, pec flap. It would reach. Um, those yeah. would be my first two options. Yeah, so agree. So yeah, so submental artery island flap is what I chose to do here. Um, you know, th again, these are, these are pretty simple. Um, I really, uh, I think it's Urjeet Patel um, has a really good video on the AHNS website and it's, it, it makes it very um, foolproof to do it. And I, that's how I do it as well. Um, and you know, you can still do a good level 1B dissection. You cannot really do a good level 1A dissection. So in, in my opinion, as the tumor goes anterior, the submental flap becomes less of a good option, okay? Because you just can't clean out that submental nodal uh, packet. Um, but this guy did great. I mean, he, he needed uh, chemo and radiation because he had ECS on his node. And, you know, I just saw him last week and he's about two years out now and he's doing great. He's swallowing everything. He's doing great. So. Can I stick it out? Um, okay. Um, Erica. Yes. How would you reconstruct this? Uh, okay. So <clears throat> it looks fairly large, but so you can, your options, you can go up the ladder. So you can do, you can talk about a skin graft, although the uh, aesthetic outcomes would not be as good for it. You could do a local tissue advancement. So you could do like a cervical facial advancement flap for this, um, or you could do like a rotational flap in, 
or you could also consider a free tissue flap, although I don't think that this defect necessitates uh, anything more than like a rotational flap. Okay, good. I agree. So, you know, I, this, that's exactly what I did, a cervical facial. The way I do it is I, I kind of come, you can see my line, I go straight back, come along the preauricular crease, and then just kind of go into the neck in a kind of a modified Blair fashion, and that allows good mobility. And you can take that line in the neck all the way down to the clavicle for more um, mobility if you need it. Um, and you can see this guy, you know, he healed fantastic. He has no ectropion, and he's, and he's doing really well. All right, um, let's see. Uh, what was, let's see who's still on here. Harleen, all right, you can do this one. All righty. Um, so this would be how I, I would reconstruct it? Yeah, yeah, this is, and, and you know, I'll just give, yeah, how would you reconstruct it? That's the question. Um, well, I mean, just based on what I can see here, he's gonna need his entire lower lip reconstructed and part of his cheek. Um, so, um, I'm not really sure where you'd get a flop from, but some sort of a flap. Okay, so Harley, no. the, big, the big issue with the free flap here is if you put a free flap in the lip, you, you, there's no oral competence, right? Unless you mm -hmm. put a sling or something like that. So if you need it, sure, you need it. But, you know, this is really about an 80% lower lip defect involving the commissure. Are there mm -hmm. any local flaps that you can think of that would help? Um, can, can you pedicle like a subventil flap? But what about something that's going to allow her to have a competent oral sphincter? An oral sphincter. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, am I getting some chats? Let's see. Gilly's fan flap. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, whoever said S lander, um, that's what I did in this patient. And you can see, so the way it works, so the S lander, the artery comes from the right superior labial artery. And you can see this little triangle I drew on here. Um, that triangle, that upper part of the lip just gets flipped down like this. And this is the patient at, you know, about two months out. And, and you can see her mouth, it doesn't, it looks pretty good. Like she does not have that bad microstomia. She can eat everything she wants. And that's with an 80% lower lip defect. So, so don't discount the uh, S lander and Abbe flap. And remember, S lander involves the commissure. Abbe does not involve the commissure. And Abbe, you have to divide later on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Thank you. OK. Um, John, why don't you tackle? Oops, crap. John, why don't you tackle this one? Or I don't know, maybe John's gone. How about, um, I don't know who else is here right now. How about Erica? I, I think I saw you, or you're still here. Uh, yeah, so this looks, it looks like a, like a posterior lesion. Uh, I can't quite tell if it's involving the lobule or not. It's, it's not involving the lobule, but it's, okay. it's like involving the entire superficial lobe of the parotid as well. Okay. Um, so you would need to do a superficial parotidectomy um, and remove all of this skin that's involved as well, uh, as well as some skin margins. Um, I mean, I think depending on how large of a defect and how much of the parotid you end up taking with it, you could either just do, again, like a cervicofacial advancement, like the skin from the neck would advance pretty nicely up there. Or if there was a large defect and you needed some bulk, you could do a flap like you could you could consider an ALT but it seems sort of uh bulky for this region because she doesn't seem to have a large um uh, a large mass in the parotid yeah so th those are all good thoughts um you know in, in these these like you know 
parotid defects that involve skin, I really like the submental island because you don't need to dissect the level 1A at all. And you don't, arguably, you don't have to dissect level 1B either. And this was a, um, this is a carcinoma ex pleomorphic. So it works really nice. Um, the patient gets a facelift along with it. This is just kind of showing how I designed it. Um, and you can see the pedicle, the submental flap just getting rotated posteriorly. And then this is her final outcome. And, you know, you can see the skin match is like perfect. It looks, it kind of refills that bulk really nicely. And she doesn't have a free flap and goes home in two days. So this is, I, I highly recommend you guys um, look into this when you have parotid defects with skin. It, it's a really good um, thing. And I think that is all I have. Thank you guys for listening and tuning in. And good luck.